Right, well, um, good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to this YHCT talk. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, textiles in churches, um, and some of them reach the status of high art. Uh, now, much of the work that's done in the Middle Ages, of course, has disappeared, but there's enough to show us uh, what an amazing uh, tradition and uh, uh, craftsmanship there was. Um, now, I'm going to start with something rather unexpected. Uh, and this, as you'll all know, is the Bayer Tapestry. Now, this, of course, was made um, in England, uh, and we are almost certain that it was commissioned. In fact, we are certain it was commissioned by Bishop Odo of Bayer, who was the legitimate half-brother of William. Um, and uh, here we have the picture, um, Hic Ficker in Prandium. So they're making a feast. And as you can see, the very small chickens, uh, they wouldn't do today. And here the Episcopus, the bishop, he's the chap with the bald head, is blessing the feast. And here is Odo uh, with Duke William, uh, who is sitting with him. Now, he's blessing the enterprise because the next one is where they cross to England. So Mare Transit, so we're crossing the sea. And then here we go, we have the Battle of Hastings. And again, Odo Episcopus, Baculus, which is Bayer in Latin. Uh, and he's giving comfort to the Pueros, which is the, the lads. And there is Duke William uh, sitting, uh, showing his face so that we all know who he is. Now, what you may ask yourselves, has this to do with the church? Uh, well, um, the first thing is, of course, that it was an ecclesiastical commission, and it was almost certainly commissioned to celebrate the completion of Bayer Cathedral by Odo in 1077. And recent work done on the cathedral, which has been rebuilt since, has suggested very strongly, and I think most people now accept it, that the tapestry was intended to be used uh, for the decoration of the 1077 nave of the cathedral. So both the dimensions work and also the episodes of the tapestry, a bit like a cartoon, it's a strip cartoon, fit exactly with the arches. Um, now, this is uh, a very early example of famous um, uh, needlework, which is done in England from about 700 onwards and became famous in, um, in Europe. And many, many pieces of English needlework were exported to Europe. Um, these were very, very high status objects. Um, and we'll have a look at some of the ones which furnish churches. Uh, there are a very few uh, lay objects uh, which remain, which are English embroidery. Um, there's the tunic of the Black Prince, and there is the, um, uh, the furnishings for the horse for Edward III. Uh, but most of the ones that survive uh, and survive because of really um, being spirited away uh, during the Reformation, um, are those in churches. So we'll have a look, first of all, at some of the church furnishings. Uh, now, this uh, wonderful object is what is called Opus Anglicanum, and it's, it's English embroidery. And the livery companies um, all had uh, funeral palls that they put over the coffins of their members so that they could have as grand a funeral as possible um, a bit like uh, burial clubs in the 19th century, uh, using the communal funeral pall. Now, this is the fishmongers. And as you can see, there is Christ and St. Peter the fisherman. There's a merman. There's a mermaid. Um, these are Opus Anglicanum. Uh, and Opus Anglicanum was enormously expensive, very high status, and could only really be afforded by people, uh, the elite, and the elite giving um, uh, furnishings and vestments to churches uh, was an important way in which they expressed their religion in the current context, expressed their status and supported the church. Now, these embroideries were fabulously expensive and many were made for export. And in fact, most of the 15 copes that we know of, which are Opus Anglicanum, uh, survived because they were exported. So in 1477, just to give you an idea, as for your cope, I have cheaped divers, that is to say, priced a few, 
and under a hundred shillings I can buy none that is of either damask or satin with flowers of gold. If you will have it made here, it will stand ye to six marks or more with the orphrey and the making, and that's the least I can drive it to. The orphrey thirty-two shillings, the lining and making eight shillings, and as for a broderer, I can find none that will come so far. So that's Robert Plumpton, who was in London, uh, writing to his father in 1477. Six years later, uh, Dame Agnes Seeley left a set of vestments in her will to St. Olive's in London, and her executors spent nearly £40 on them. Now, just to give you a sense of the scale of this, £20 was the minimum yearly income derived from land that was required to maintain knightly status. So Dame Agnes bequeathed two years' income to be sent, spent on a set of vestments. Now, here is the mermaid from the fishmonger's pall, and this is a superlative example of Opus Anglicanum. Stitched, the background is what's called couched, so that there's a thread on the top of the fabric, another one underneath, and you pass the underneath thread through the fabric over the top of the, uh, the stitch on the top, and back down again, and that gives you that quilted effect. Here we've got gold hair. Uh, the skin tones are amazing. Uh, and here we have the mermaid's mirror. Now, mermaids were reputed to be extremely vain, and they always carried a mirror to make sure they looked at their best. Uh, so, you know, uh, modern uh, internet people have got nothing um, on mermaids. And here we've got the very faint reflection of the mermaid in her mirror, done with the utmost skill. And here is another funeral pall. Now, this one is a testament to what happened to these very, very expensive vestments and furnishings uh, when the Reformation came along. Now, this is the worshipful company of saddlers. And here are their arms. So here's a medieval saddle with the raised pommel and cantle. Uh, here we've got the stirrups. Uh, and here we have a figure in the middle without a head. Uh, this is in fact the Virgin, uh, and here at the end we can see her again. And the reason she is headless is because when uh, images were forbidden at the Reformation, the saddlers had her head unpicked so that she didn't contravene the regulations and they could carry on using their funeral pall. And here we have, uh, probably a little bit later, now this is an altar frontal, uh, probably for a private chapel. And this we know from the heraldry is the fourth Earl of Westmoreland. Um, now he married his wife, Catherine Stafford, in 1323. And this altar frontal shows them with their seven sons and 13 daughters. Now the v and rather innocently suggests that it was made between 1335 eight years after their marriage, and 1355. Now, if you can fit 20 children into eight years, you're a better woman than I am. Uh, I strongly suspect that the date is much nearer to, 30, to 1550 than it would be to the year of marriage. Um, and again, this is these background fabrics are luxurious Italian silk velvet. And in this case, the embroidered sections have been appliqued onto them, embroidered separately. So here you have the carpet of flowers, you have the crucifixion, you have uh, the two Marys, a big one, you have Mary and St. John the Evangelist. Um, and there is Catherine uh, Stafford uh, and her husband, complete with the full set, including um, the full um, uh, achievement of arms. Now, here is another altar frontal, and this is a fascinating story. Now, this is from Backton Church, and it was given to the church by Dame Blanche Parry, who was the favourite lady-in-waiting of Queen Elizabeth I. Now, it was obviously something else before it was made into an altar frontal, because you can see the seams here, and there's another seam over on the other side, uh, there's uh, various other seams at the back, which are pretty conclusively suggest that it was made from a garment. And recent research has suggested, and I'm sure it's right, uh, that it was a dress of Queen Elizabeth that was given to Blanche Parry, uh, and Blanche Parry then used it to make an altar frontal. Now, the fabric is very interesting. It's silver, 
and it's embroidered professionally on the silver to make uh, the wonderful uh, pattern on the dress. But later on, somebody who was an amateur embroiderer embroidered butterflies and birds and the odd worm. Now, the professional embroiderers knew that when you embroidered, you had to keep the tension right to prevent the fabric from puckering. And all the professional embroidery sits flat upon this silver fabric. But the strain put on the fabric by the amateur embroidery, which is at the wrong tension, has meant that that has pulled the fabric, can you see, so that the surface has been degraded. But again, this is Queen Elizabeth's dress, the only surviving one that we know. And here is the rainbow portrait in Hatfield House, where she appears to be wearing the identical dress. Um, so underneath the eyes and carrying the rainbow, there is a dress of the fabric, which looks exactly the same. Now, those are church furnishings, uh, some of them. Church vestments uh, carry a heavy, heavy weight of history and expectation um, and a heavy weight of the way in which ideas and religious practices change. Now, I'm going to start with sort of basic stuff. Um, I'll have to use some technical language to describe these vestments. So here's a modern set for high mass. Don't forget, everything was Catholic um, in the Middle Ages. Um, and in high mass, you'll have a priest, a celebrant. You'll have one or two deacons or priests helping him. Um, and so a high mass set will have uh, a cope or cape, which is worn in procession, which is that. It'll have a chasuble for the celebrant priest, which is the sleeveless garment, which goes over um, the, uh, the alb. Uh, it will have dalma a dalmatic or two dalmatics, which are the sleeved garments, which go to the, um, go to the assistants. Uh, there will be a stole, uh, there will be a maniple, and that's rather like the waiter's white napkin that goes over his sleeve. The priest wears that on the hand which holds the chalice with the hosts in. And then there will be a chalice veil which covers the chalice and keeps the hosts um, uh, free of, of contamination. So that's a modern full set for high mass. Bear that in mind when I go through the various uh, items that you're going to see. So let's have a look at the amount, uh, the number of vestments that belonged to Wally Abbey in 1537 when they were dissolved and the commissioners took an inventory. Now they had 21 copes, that are the great, those are the great big capes. They had nine full mass sets and they had 25 chasubles in all. So 25 chasubles, don't forget, of course, that in an abbey quite often there will be several masses going on at the same time. Um, but this is an enormous amount of material that had to be stored. And indeed, it says uh, that there is a standard, that is to say, a chest in which they kept all of these things. Um, let me show you one. So this is in York Minster. Uh, and it is a cope chest, which is used for keeping uh, these, these um, copes and vestments. It's waist height on me. It's an enormous object. Um, and it's almost certainly about 1290, uh, because the ironwork on it is the same as the ironwork on the chapter house, um, so that the two are probably contemporaneous. Now, copes were stored by being folded in half, and then the, you know, the... Uh, stored flat. So in a chest like that, you would have been able to store a large number of copes, which gives you an inkling of the number and variety and probably quality um, of the copes that were in use in York Minster during the Middle Ages. And here is one of the Wally Abbey copes. Now this is Italian velvet. Um, it's 15th century, probably about 17, sorry, 1470s. Lilies. Remember this pattern of angels, because you'll see it later. And you'll act actually see these lilies later in a rather unexpected place. Now, copes and chasubles had what's called an orphrey, 
uh, which was used uh, for the front and indeed the back on chasubles. And these are, it's like a strip cartoon. So when you put the off through the cape round your shoulders, these are the right way up. And they show in this case, various saints in the framework. Uh, in some cases, you'll see a scene. Um, uh, and uh, these are all embroidered in the most minute detail, which we'll see in a minute. So this particular cope, um, the Wally Abbey vestments, uh, and here is the next one, which is the Wally Dalmatic. Now there was a full set that was also rescued from Wally Abbey or bought um, by Robert, Sir Robert Townley. Um, and he spirited them away and put them in his private chapel. The Townley family remained Catholic. Um, and so he got this full set and he got the Wally Dalmatic and they remained at Townley Hall, his family house, until 1922, when the whole lot was sold by Sotheby's. Now, the great cope uh, was bought by an American collector and is now in a museum in Chicago. But this was bought back by the Townley Hall Museum. Uh, and most of the set, one of them went up to the Burrell Museum, and it can still be seen there today. Now, let me show you uh, the amazing. This is one of the scenes on the Dalmatic, uh, which is uh, the nativity. So here is Mary, um, and here is the Christ, swaddled Christ child. There is the ox, there is the ass, all done in minute needlework. Um, the estimation was that it took four hours to do one square inch of this kind of work. So you can imagine how long it would have taken to do an orphrey, which is the going up and back and over the um, around the back. Look at the shading that they've done. So here is the shading on Joseph's robe, shading on his beard, the shading on the Virgin's blanket, um, and the extraordinary uh, detail. I mean, these are about fifteen inches by about eight. Um, so you're looking at. Uh, painting with the needle. I mean, there's no other word for it. And here again, in much more detail, you can see how they got the effect. So the top, this is a, um, a split stitch, as you can probably see. But the other stitch that was used was what's called a couching stitch, where you have thread underneath the fabric and another thread on the top. And you pass the thread underneath the fabric up and over the top and then back again. So you make a kind of quilting almost um, in, in very, very small scale. Um, and one of the real masterpieces of this is this lovely thing, which is the steeple Aston cope, which is now um, largely in pieces it's at the V&A. But this wonderful thing um, is... Um, the steeple Aston cope, and it's an angel playing a theobore. Let me go back a bit. Do we? Um, and you can see from the dappled grey of the horse and the way in which the shading of the angel's wings is so beautifully managed. Um, and then, of course, the much coarser couch work, couching work for the background. You can see the way in which the angel's robe is draping over the stirrups. Um, and the way in which his hands uh, work. Um, these are absolute masterpieces of embroidery. Uh, incidentally, the horse has got a beautiful jeweled brow band and uh, what can only be described as a jeweled necklace because I don't know any bit of harness that would look anything like that. But it's estimated that a fully embroidered cope took about 50,000 hours of work. So that's four years or five years work for four or five embroiderers. Um, they were exquisite and they were extraordinarily expensive. So um, you, if you were a high status, um, uh, so for example, if you go back to the Wally Abbey inventory and you'll see that some of the uh, copes there bore the arms of L Lord Monteagle, uh, many of the elite uh, had them made and gave specially um, to um, you know to their local church or abbey. Now here we have um, the Chichester Constable Chasuble, and I'm afraid that the intrusion of the um, of the speaker is rather in the way of it. But I'll try and work my way through it with you. Now this 
uh, was sold from Burton Constable in 1927 by Sir Rory, Chichester Constable. Constables, of course, were a Catholic family. Um, and it went in 1927 to the Metropolitan Museum of New York, uh, where it still is, of course. Um, and here you can see, again, the stories. So this is uh, the back of the, co the, the chasuble. At the bottom is the Annunciation. So here is the angel and there is Mary. Here is the nativity and the three kings. And above is the coronation of the Virgin. And then if you look at the front of the cope, now this was altered a bit in the 17th century when fashions changed, uh, but we still have um, opposing saints. So here we have St. Andrew and St. James. And we know it's St. James because there's the scallop shell for the pilgrim and the pilgrim's hat. Here we have St. Peter with his key and St. Paul. And the unfortunate saints at the top have lost their heads, which is rather a shame. Now, um, this we know was old in 1559. In 1559, uh, Margaret Constable made her will and she described the ancient vestment that she then left to the family. So it was her property. Now she was a Scroop. Uh, so this was originally um, from the Scroop family and probably dates from about 1320. And again, we're looking at this wonderful Italian red velvet and the English embroidery on the top. Um, the suggestion might well be, since they were associated with uh, Edward III, that um, this was uh, partly a celebration of that relationship. I'm not sure you can stand that one up, but um, it is an interesting theory. Now, again, uh, from Yorkshire, uh, here we've got, um, and this is... Uh, Abbot Thornton died in 1533. This was his chasuble. He was the Abbot of Jervo. Um, now, again, you'll remember, I'm sure, the uh, pattern of the angels on the great Wally Cope, and that's exactly the same. 1533, more than 100 years after the Wally Cope was made. So that pattern was well established by the embroiderers. And here we've got R.T., which is Robert Thornton. Unpicked is the outline of what was the barrel underneath. And up here is the thorn tree. And if we look at his memorial stone, which was moved from the abbey at the dissolution by the monks to Middleham Church, we have exactly the same design. Was that taken from his cope uh, when he died? to form part of his memorial. Who knows, but it, the barrel is there, unpicked on the chasuble, R and T in exactly the same uh, design, the same uh, device of the thorn tree. So uh, you know, the two objects very clearly go together and demonstrate a very strong sense of identity, not just of the abbot, of course, but of the uh, abbey itself. But now we're going to move on to something fabulously expensive uh, and fabulously um, uh, difficult to produce. This is the only remaining cope of a set of 29 that Henry VII had made in 1499. And we have the documentation in the wardrobe accounts. They were woven in Lucca and Florence in Italy on special looms that could do 14 feet wide. And they cost the 29, uh, the equivalent of between five and 10 million pounds in today's money. Now, 29 is an odd number, uh, and it represents the number of bishops uh, that were serving at the time of Henry VII. Uh, now, it's suggested that he had them made for the coronation of his son, Prince Arthur. Um, talk about planning ahead. At the time that this was made, uh, Prince Arthur was 13, and Henry still had 10 or more years to live. Um, whether or not uh, that was uh, the coronation idea is a, um, is a sensible one, I'm not sure. But what I do know is that Prince Arthur married Catherine of Aragon two years later in 1501, when these were completed. And I would imagine that they were used in that service. Later on, they went to Henry VIII, uh, and they went to the field of the cloth of gold. 
Then 19 of them eventually went to Westminster Abbey. They were bequeathed there. And there they remained, except this one that was somehow spirited away by an, a London merchant, a Catholic London merchant called John Cotton. And he gave them to the Jesuits who gave it to the Jesuits who took it to Saint Omer, where it survived. In 1643, at the time when the iconoclasts were taking the heads off the statues in the Henry VII Chapel in Westminster Abbey, all the remaining copes from this set, all 18 of them, were burnt. So this is the only surviving one. And this is Italian weaving at its absolute climax and top, an amazing object. And right at the other end of the scale, very, very poor parishes without a rich patron also wanted vestments for their, uh, for their services. So Moorbath in Dartmoor, and it didn't have a rich patron. Uh, it was pretty much subsistence farming, mm. but their priest wanted a good set of funeral vestments so he could give his parishioners a decent funeral. So in 1529, he started a fund to buy black vestments for the funeral. And the parish saved a few shillings at a time for nearly 20 years. And at last, in 1547, they purchased the vestments. They were made in the workshop of a Devon priest, and it was a full set. Cope, chasuble, cannon, and a stole of black velvet. So they were taken to be blessed by the bishop and presented to the parish meeting on the 30th of October, 1548. Spot the date, Edward VI. On the 2nd of November, 1548, clergy were forbidden to wear black coats under the Edwardian injunctions. And 11 years later, all vestments were forbidden under the Elizabethan injunctions. Um, your heart bleeds for the parishioners of Moorbath. Um, I'm quite sure uh, you know, vestments and so on were, were required to be sent up to the bishop, um, no doubt to be either destroyed or sold abroad. But... 20 years saving, and uh, that happens. And here are the 59, 1559, second year of Elizabeth's reign, the royal articles and injunctions, which put a stop peremptorily to all this wonderful um, uh, ecclesiastical work in England. So the minister at the time of the communion shall use neither alb, vestment, or cope, but being bishop or archbishop, he shall wear a rochet, that's a square cap, a black cap. And being priest or deacon, he shall have and wear a surplice only. So at a stroke, all the remaining vestments were banned, and many were burnt or they were unpicked for their gold thread or fabrics. And of course, Catholic worship, as we all know, went underground. And here we have uh, vestments let me go back. Here we have the vestments made for what the Puritans called a hedgerow priest. That is a Catholic priest who had to say mass, sometimes in the open air, sometimes in rooms, uh, concealed uh, uh, all the time at uh, in danger of being exposed. Um, the Jesuits uh, sent, of course, many priests over um, and their life expectancy was probably a bit less than that of a lieutenant on the front line in the First World War. Now, this is the 1640s, we think, and it's at the Bar Convent in York. It's woven cotton uh, in the liturgical colours. So the liturgical colours are green for every day, uh, white for festivals and special occasions, black for funerals, and purple for <clears throat> penitential uh, festivals. Um, but of course, being cotton, I mean, there's, a, there's the stole underneath and the maniple, uh, they could be rolled up quickly into a small package and concealed. Um, and, uh, you know, the full set of um, in, embroidered vestments were, were, if they were in private houses, they were hidden away somewhere very safe indeed. And we'll see indeed some that were a bit later on. So we move on and we move through uh, the 1600s and most of the 1700s where churches were pretty bare. They were whitewashed, 
there was very little in the way of uh, church furnishings, particularly fabrics, textiles. Um, of course, the stained glass windows had in most cases been smashed. Uh, the statues uh, had been destroyed. Um, it was uh, a very, um, uh, I won't say bleak, but certainly plain interior. Until we get to the Gothic Revival. Um, and just before we get there, let's just pause and have a look at the Bar Convent. This is 1769, these vestments. Thomas Atkinson had just finished building the concealed chapel in the Bar Convent in York. And they had it was opened in 1769, and these vestments were commissioned for that opening. As you can see, it's a high mass set. So there's the chasuble for the priest celebrating mass and two dalmatics for the uh, deacons. Um, and these are woven brocade, probably from France. Uh, this, this was much more the fashion uh, than, uh, well, they would probably not have been able to find embroiderers to make an embroidered set of that period anyway. <laughs> On to the Gothic revival. So churches began to be built with reference to Gothic architecture, and the interiors began to be furnished with reference to Gothic interiors. And William Morris, of course, was at the forefront of the movement for providing furnishings for interiors, especially stained glass um, and, of course, tapestries. And as he said in his sales catalogue, um, always a good salesman, tapestry is by far the most appropriate and beautiful form of decoration for a reredos or blank wall space and is less costly for its size than a painting by a good artist would be. And indeed, uh, he sold um, tapestries uh, for this very purpose. Now, this one is the Ministering Angels, and it's a tapestry from a design by Burne Jones, which actually originated as a, a stained glass window and was then translated into a tapestry design and woven at Merton Abbey. Uh, there's a, another one in the set, which is the Praising Angels, um, and th those two... Um, are in several churches, Eton College Chapel, for example, and much Wenlock Church. Um, Eton College Chapel also commissioned from Byrne Jones and from Morris a tapestry for the Nativity. And again, that's in Eton College Chapel. It is possible to go and visit Eton College Chapel, um, which is full of the most amazing things uh, and um, some survivals there that you don't find in many other places. Uh, so if you ever get the chance, do go and look. And here at Much Wenlock, again, this is Burne Jones, and this is the altar frontal with the two tapestries at the back behind it. Uh, and this, of course, is embroidery um, designed by Burne Jones. I'm not quite sure who did the embroidery, quite possibly one of Morris's uh, female family, the female members of Morris's family. But again, you can see the reference with the flowing lines to the um, to medieval embroideries. And this um, uh, emphasis on embroidery uh, became much more widespread. Now, Elizabeth Leake Wardle was married to a man called Wardle, who I believe um, did a lot of, supplied a lot of the coloured wools for Morris um, at the Merton Abbey uh, tapestry works. Um, now, she took an interest in embroidery, particularly, um, you know, given Morris's influence, and she started the Leek School of Embroidery, uh, where many women, she uh, uh, started to make uh, embroideries in the medieval style. And here are some made by her. These are the Orders of Angels, as you can see. And again, done in medieval style, not quite using the medieval technique of couching, but Fairly similar. Um, so, you know, and of course, these are completely embroidered um, uh, and not appliqued onto a fabric. Um, here is another example uh, of the Leek uh, School of Embroidery. And do you recognize this? That lily appears on the Wally Chasuble, uh, Pope, I beg your pardon. How did Elizabeth Leek? know that. Where did she get that reference from? Oh, she is in Lancashire, and so is Wally Abbey. 
Did she see the Tarni uh, fabrics? I wonder whether she did. But this, um, again, this is 1910, uh, this cope made, uh, embroidered by the Leek School. And then we get to the First World War. And generally speaking, um, the memorials to those lost in the war tended not to be textiles. Uh, they were windows. Uh, they were, uh, you know, full chapels. I mean, we, we all know, uh, for example, um, Stanley Spencer's uh, magnificent memorial paintings. Um, and we get into the 1920s and again, uh, you know, after the war. Uh, and then we get a completely new departure. So in 1931, the Dean of Winchester Cathedral uh, commissioned Sybil Blunt, uh, who was the artist, and uh, Louisa Pascal, who was a, a, an embroiderer, to make soft furnishings, that is to say, kneelers and cushions for Winchester Cathedral. And they enlisted and trained many women um, to do this work. And they, they basically furnished the entire cathedral. And that included 360 odd kneelers in different patterns, all designed by Sybil Blunt. Um, and here are some which were made by the local women. Now, this began uh, a movement to provide uh, kneelers and cushions in parish churches, which evolved over the years into an amazing folk art. Um, so when materials became more available after the war, uh, many, many, many churches and many, many, uh, you know, people uh, wanted to make uh, kneelers. Um, by the way, I think kneelers, um, and this is my own theory, were probably developed because in the 1920s or uh, early 20s onwards, shirts got skirts got shorter and women wore silk stockings. Now, kneeling on a stone floor in your silk stockings cannot have done the silk stockings any good. So I strongly suspect that these kneelers were at least partly a response to uh, female fashions, um, where you could gently rest your knees and your stockings on your kneeler without having to darn them when you got home. But here we have this wonderful form of folk art. So here we've got the bowls and tennis club, We've got the three bells here. We've got the wheel uh, at the back there. Alas, I think obscured, there is a kangaroo. And there are many, many, many um, glorious examples of folk art celebrating absolutely everything about local life, which are found in churches throughout the land. So here we have um, the Great Tuin Village Shop. Okay, so here it is. And in Great Tuin, you also have the start of the bus service. So here is the Great Tuin bus service. Um, and here we have the local livestock, complete with cat. Uh, these are all made by amateurs, uh, you know, and made um, really out of love. Um, and they're designed, you know, by the people who made them. Uh, this is, these are not professionals. This is quite the opposite end of the spectrum to the medieval embroiderers, but utterly charming. And they did, of course, national heroes. Here is Winston Churchill, who looks rather grumpy at having been knelt on. And local heroes, Bobby Robson, CBE. Now, although I know we all think of embroiderers as being female, I do hope this was made by a man, um, a fan of Newcastle United. Uh, either that or he badgered his wife until she made this kneeler, um, which is the local hero, Bobby Robson. But of course, during the 20th century, the Great Commission uh, for uh, church textiles, ecclesiastical textiles, was of course Coventry Cathedral. And here is the Great Tapestry, 1962, designed by Graham Sutherland, woven in France, uh, and uh, dominating the nave of Coventry Cathedral. It's 23 metres high. It's 13 metres wide. That is to say it's bigger than a cricket pitch. Um, and it weighs, I think, two tonnes, although I'm open to correction. Um, and that 
is the kind of scale and the kind of commitment that replicates the scale and commitment, uh, perhaps, of some of the medieval textiles uh, that we've seen. Certainly in terms of money, I mean, the cost of that was astronomical uh, and probably relates to the cost of Henry the Second's Henry the Seventh's uh, 29 copes. And we'll go full circle for the last slide. And here we have at the Bar Convent in York, um, a, an Opus Anglicanum orphrey, and this is one of the panels from it, which was given to the Bar Convent in 1960 by the Middleton family of Ilkley, who'd had it in their position since before the Reformation. And it's been mounted on a modern, as you can see, um, uh, brocade fabric, uh, and is now a chasuble which unites the modern fabric with the medieval embroidery. And if you want to look at Opus Anglicanum in great detail, just go to the Bar Convent in York and buy a four pound ticket to their museum and you can study it in detail. So that's uh, a skim over the wonderful uh, world of church textiles in England. Of course, many on the continent still survive um, and are just as luscious as the ones we've seen today. Um, but next time you go into your local church and look at the kneelers, remember uh, that the skill, although it's perhaps not at the same level, is still there to produce church textiles. Okay, thank you very much indeed.